Hey everybody, uh, today I got not only a great one, you know, for a change, but I'm going to say this is easily one of the best, if not the best, podcast I've ever done. You are going to be blown away by Heather McGee. I met Heather 12 years ago. Uh, she was then head of Demos, a very effective organization that fights racial and financial injustice. And we worked together on legislation to fight predatory lending. Heather's been uh, fighting the good fight for 20 years now. Uh, you're going to be very inspired by her intellect, her eloquence, and by uh, her very real but hopeful book, The Sum of Us. The Sum of Us is a very important book, and it is of the moment. It's called The Sum of Us because it addresses the central economic and political issue that has been plaguing this country from its very beginning. But it's especially of this moment, and that is that the powerful and, and the wealthy, and at this moment we're talking about the Republican Party, Republican leadership. They've sold whites the idea that our economy, our society is a zero-sum game. That anything that helps blacks and people of color takes away from them. This is profoundly important because they've sold this. This idea goes as far back as slave owners telling poor whites, hey, at least you're better off than black folks, better off than slaves. You know, I, I held the Senate seat that was held by Paul Wellstone, who said, we all do better when we all do better. We all do better when we all do better. And that's what the sum of us is all about. We all do better when we all do better. Again, this book is very real, but it's also incredibly uplifting. You are going to love this conversation with Heather because you'll be inspired and, and hopeful. And there's lots of reason to be hopeful right now, right at this this moment, because this $1.9 trillion package is such a big deal. As President Biden would say, look, this is a big deal, folks. I'm not joking. This is, a, this is not hyperbole, folks. It's a big deal. Because of the child tax credit, it takes half our kids out of poverty. This is a big deal, folks. No joke. And here is the great part about this. Over 70% of the American people were for it. Republicans were for it. And yet, not one Republican in Congress voted for it. This is going to help hundreds of millions of Americans, most of them white people. And they know it. The people know it. This is a huge moment. The Republican Party is completely out of touch with reality now. And this is why I am so optimistic right now and why Heather's book, The Sum of Us, is so important. Now, to keep this going, we have to address voting rights. Republicans know that the only way they can win elections going forward is to suppress votes. Nationally, they've put forward more than 250 bills to suppress votes in 43 states. And the next big fight is going to be Senate Bill 1. The bill that, that same bill that passed the House, it restores the Voting Rights Act to what it was pre-Shelby County, it does a lot of other good stuff on voting. And Republicans know that their only way forward is to suppress votes. And this is why we have to do something about the filibuster. Now, you've maybe uh, heard me and Norm Ornstein on this podcast talk about filibuster reform a number of times. We are not going to get rid of the filibuster in this Congress. Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema are not going to vote to get rid of the filibuster. They've said no, they're not going to do that. But Norm and I have been working on a reform of the filibuster that Joe Manchin is now open to. Instead of requiring 60 votes to end a filibuster, it would require 41 votes to sustain a filibuster. Well, so what, Al? They, they have, they've got 50. Okay, this is what you have to understand. To filibuster now, one 
Republican jerk just has to say, I object. And then you need 60 senators to end the filibuster. Our reform would require 41 senators to be on the floor to vote to continue a filibuster. They'd have to show up on the floor of the Senate any time that the majority leader calls a quorum call, say at, oh, I don't know, three in the morning, then 41 Republican senators will have to show up on the floor and vote at three in the morning. And believe me, that will get old fast. It will get old fast because many of them are already old. Chuck Grassley is 87. Richard Shelby is 86. He'll be 87 in May. Happy birthday. I'm in May too. Mitch McConnell is about to be 79. And they would have to sleep near the floor <laughs> to get to the boat. And not only that, once the 41 voted to sustain the filibuster, they would have to hold the floor and speak to the issue at hand, in this case, voting rights. No green eggs and ham Ted, I am. This would restore the filibuster to what it was, the opportunity for the minority to debate an issue that they really care about. And I would love to see that debate. I would love the American people to see that debate. Make your argument on why you need these obscure and, yes, racist voter suppression provisions. No early voting on Sunday? Hmm, who does that target? What's the purpose of that? Can you tell me that? One of their election lawyers, Michael Carvin, told the Supreme Court a couple weeks ago, told them, it works to our advantage. He said, elections are a zero-sum game. Republicans may look at it that way, but elections aren't a zero-sum game. America isn't a zero-sum game. In her book, The Sum of Us, Heather writes about how the early 60s, when, when the courts ordered community swimming pools, these huge community swimming pools to be integrated, officials in communities all around the country drained the pools. In Montgomery, Alabama, they filled filled in a pool that a thousand people could swim in and they planted grass over it. Everyone lost. That doesn't have to be America. That isn't America. We all do better when we all do better. This is my best podcast ever. Please give a listen. probably don't remember this, but I worked with your team really closely on Dodd-Frank and um, the credit ratings um, reform and just generally, you know, you were one of the rump group of senators who saw the problem for what it was. And I'll always be grateful to your leadership. Well, wait, for, whoa, 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 Heather. That yeah, to, why that, didn't we do that before you recorded? Don't do that before we're recording. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, you got it? Okay, get this part on tape two where I'm I'm chastising her. Okay, now nah, that's fine then. <laughs> I love the book. Love the book. Thank you. The sum of us. Oh man, there's so much in it. It's so comprehensive in a great way. And basically, zero sum sort of sums it up, which is that uh, everybody, but particularly whites, uh, see that. If other people gain, they lose. Is that what zero sum would be? Yep, that's exactly right. And it's a racial story. It's basically the idea that America is made up of racial groups that are in competition with each other for status on a hierarchical ladder. So if people of color gain, that is directly in competition with white people's status. And therefore, anything that could be perceived or sold as benefiting people of color white people will be opposed to, even if it also benefits them. And that's been our history from the very beginning, yeah. uh, beginning with the indigenous people. Yeah. 
And then, of course, slavery. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty zero sum. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, Paul Wellstone, one of my predecessors in, in mm-hmm. my sentence, said this. He said, we all do better when we all do better. Yeah. And I think the, the book so speaks to that. But the use of this zero sum game thinking to divide us. And, and it hurts us all. That's the point you make in this book over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to play maybe a little later. Well, why don't I do it right now? Did you happen to see the um, hearings for Merrick Garland? Not all of them, but... This, this is, uh, I didn't see it all either, but one struck me, which was John Kennedy from Louisiana. Oh, okay. Okay, listen to this one, <laughs> and let me tell you what you think. Oh, boy. So you're basically saying there's a, there's a disparate impact. There's disparate impact, which um, in some cases is the consequence of um, uh, historical patterns. Sometimes uh, uh, is the consequence okay, of let me, let me uh, unconscious this. bias and some sure. kind of uh, 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 consciousness. Uh, when you were at the Department of Justice, yes. was the Department of Justice then systemically racist? I think each we look for a pattern or practice in each institution. When you talk about a specific institution, you look for its pattern and practices. But but you how do you know what you know? In other words, you say an institution is systemically racist. I, I didn't say any particular institution. I, I know I'm not I'm not saying you yeah, did. Yeah. I'm saying if you say an institution is systemically racist, how do you know what you know? Do you measure it by a disparate impact? controlling you for other factors? Well, the, the very specific... Or do you, you just look at the numbers and say the, the system must be racist. Well, okay, what's your <laughs> reaction to that? So this country is suffering from the fact that when it comes to the narrative war, the South won. And what I mean by that is the amount of history that this very young country does not know including people who hold elected office um, and write our laws, laws that sit in a body of laws that almost exclusively were written with racism holding the pen. It's just astronomical, the degree to which there's so much historical lack of knowledge and, and that the narratives, the racist narratives, the victim blaming narratives, the erasure of, of history um, that was part of the Lost Cause project after the Confederate failure uh, to secede and to retain slavery. Um, it's, just, it's just tremendous. So when I hear someone like the Senator from Louisiana speaking about systemic racism and trying to cast doubt on the idea that racist outcomes come from racist policies, right? So the thing you're supposed to sort of read into that is, well, shouldn't you be controlling it for other factors, for example, maybe that people of color just aren't as good, right? That's, right, that's the other factor he's talking about. That's, um, that's kind of what I got out of that myself, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's what that is, right? That that's what that is, right? Because it's like, how do you? How does one? No, not being glib about it, because I actually think that this is a this is a problem that afflicts most Americans coming out of this era of colorblindness, um, where that was supposed to be our norm. You had the civil rights period where there was an awareness of you know the whites only signs and the segregated schools and and the you know no blacks need apply, and then you had a period of about 40 years of c- complete flux and where those signs were taken away and yet there was never a real effort to both change the enormous racial wealth gap that was created by racist public policy by our federal government over the course of all of the wealth building policies from the homesteading, well, from slavery through the Homestead Act um, through to the GI Bill and, and the further mortgage subsidies. There was no attempt to really reckon with the, you know, 10 to 1, 13 to 1 racial wealth divide. And then there was no attempt to really understand the degree to which 
the persistent economic divides and segregation would continue to create disparate economic outcomes. But because there were no whites only signs anymore, the you know average white American mind had to find another reason to explain the disparities. And what was right there at the ready was the same old racist stereotypes that had justified the segregation and the inequality in the first place. Black people don't try as hard. Immigrants are, you know, inveterately criminal. Black people are inveterately criminal. You know, and so that's 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 what I read in that um, exchange is a is a real resistance as the right wing has had to just acknowledging the extent of racist policies. What what's interesting to me is um, after George Floyd, we really finally I think had Americans, a, a large majority of Americans, say, you know, there is systemic racism in this country, and it took that and a a rash of murders by police and other things to finally get there. But we still had these people, I guess, like Senator Kennedy and like Donald Trump saying, no, there's no systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And what I really wanted to ask publicly every of everyone was, okay, when did it end? Mm. What was it? What was the point where, oh, it ended? Was mm-hmm. it the 1964 Civil Rights Bill? Oh, wait a minute. No, 65 Voting Rights Act. No predatory lending? Mm-hmm. When when did this end, you asshole, I would say, maybe? <laughs> you idiot, maybe. I mean, what the hell? Another theme of your book and, and the whole point of the concept of zero sum is there's also those at sort of at the top, dividing us, dividing our country. And you see the people invading the Capitol, Mm -hmm. telling them that any gain for people of color is a loss for you. Mm -hmm. The zero sum, part of why it's such a distinctive and powerful American poison that is used by the plutocrats to keep the economic system rigged in their favor and always has been is because what it does is it makes people who believe it resent and fight against common solutions to the common problems that they have with other people who are struggling. So take the Nissan story. I traveled to Mississippi in the wake of a failed organizing drive uh, by workers there at a at an auto factory. And I talked to the workers, black, white management and shop, and they really were clear that there was a racial divide in the you know, in the in the plant. And that as one of the workers I talked to, a guy named Joey said, you know, the white folks here have got their southern mentality. If the blacks are for it, I'm against it. And there was really a sense that the word union was dog whistle for lazy black people. And so even though it was, you know, clear certainly to the people who were pro-organizing and to anyone who could compare, you know, the wages and benefits that were in the non-union South versus in Detroit and their competitors who were organized by the UAW, um, that it would be that unionization would get them the bargaining rights for better wages and better benefits, for more job security, for better working conditions on the plant floor. And yet it was pretty clear from my research that race was the the underlying factor in causing white folks to vote against it. Um, there were also a, a fair number of Black people who voted against it because of a similar reason, that it seemed like it was sort of admitting defeat to link arms across uh, together with your fellow workers and say, we need to we need to bargain. There's a sort of aspirational, we shouldn't need each other, right? We should need, we should just need the market, right? And that's been the right wing story, right? It, it really started, gained steam with Nixon in the wake of civil rights, uh, the civil rights movement, And the story was fear people of color, hate the government because the government sides with people of color against you. And therefore, who do you trust? The market and the 1%. Before the civil rights movement, the typical white American was a New Deal Democrat 
who had benefited tremendously from a massive government handout to create the white middle class. As I said, from you know the Homestead Act through the New Deal, which gave enormous subsidies to your typical white American, and most of those, either by design or by impact, were racially exclusive. The job categories that most Black people held were excluded from the labor protections. The housing subsidies that created the contemporary mortgage market and put tens of millions of working class people with no down payment into home ownership for the first time in history was based on maps that were drawn to deliberately exclude Black neighborhoods out of the never substantiated assertion that Black home buyers would be risky. And so you had this sort of invisible handout to create a white middle class. And what happened when Democrats said, you know what, we're going to extend these benefits across the color line to people that, frankly, the government had been teaching white Americans to disdain and distrust for generations, white people said enough with government. It was a massive betrayal. And what ended up happening, of course, and this is why my book is about the cost of racism to everyone, is that white people then turned their backs on the formula that had created the middle class and threw in their lot with a party and an economic ideology that has created nothing but wealth at the top and inequality for everybody else. It it sort of um, resurrected or uh, duplicated the original white slave-owning class telling poor whites... Uh, at least you're better <laughs> than uh, poor blacks. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So when we have a society that is as hierarchical and brutal as American society has been, the presence of this class of people that are meant to be sort of permanently on the bottom. Um, and, you know, in the times of slavery and Jim Crow, you know, you need only look at the condition of your Black neighbor to see exactly what you don't want to be, the way you don't want to be treated in the eyes of the state and society, the rightslessness, the poverty, you know, just the, the dehumanization. And so that was a wedge and a cudgel for the white elite in creating those laws that created that you know, brutal hierarchy of human value in society what it did was it lured white people to side with their race instead of their class. And so you could have folks struggling at the bottom of the economic ladder, but white people would always be at least one rung above on the racial ladder. And so it's that clinging to that status that is inherently threatened, according to the zero-sum story, by the presence and progress of people of color, that sociologists have researched, it makes people, white people, more conservative. You talk to them about the demographic changes coming in America, happening already, and politically unaffiliated white people become more conservative, like in the, in the course of a survey design, right? Um, on not just, you know, issues like government spending, where you see a 60 percentage point gulf between if I'm a white person with low racial resentment, I am 60 percentage points more likely to support increased government spending on behalf of the people. Racial resentment is the terrain on which these questions of economic policy um, have been decided ever since the civil rights movement, you know, extended for once, finally, the web of public protection and public benefits across the, the color line. Uh, you know, uh, there's a couple things you write about that I want to bring up to talk about. For example, white people shooting themselves in the foot so that black people don't get something. And mm. one, one really stark example is a communities closing their swimming pools, draining their swimming pools <laughs> when they were required to integrate their swimming pools. So it's summer, and we're not going to have our kids have a swimming pool, a beautiful, beautiful community swimming pool that everyone loves. We're going to drain that so that black kids and black people can't swim in it. That's exactly right. And and this is a story that ended up being really the parable at the heart of the sum of us, because it's just a really concrete way to understand the shift. You know, I, I grew up, Al, in the sort of progressive economic orthodoxy. I'm somebody who, who worked on economic policy for nearly 20 years. 
And I learned the story of this sort of golden era of shared prosperity from the New Deal into the 1970s as a time when taxes were high, they were plowed into public investments, college was free or close to free, um, you know, working class people could join a union, the minimum wage was high, there were just all of the, you know, businesses were heavily regulated, antitrust was enforced, so you could hang a shingle on every corner. It was this sort of like golden era. And frankly, you know, it's something that Donald Trump harkens back to when he says make America great again. He's talking about that period of time. And what he's making loud is the part of the story, which was that that whole contract had an asterisk to it, and it was for whites only. Now, how do you sort of really understand that in the most vivid way. It's a story that I unearthed in the book that happened all over the country, and importantly, not just in the segregated South, quote unquote, where we used to have, it's just one of the symbols of that kind of commitment that the government had in this period to a high standard of living for its favored citizens, which was grand, lavish resort-style swimming pools that could hold over a thousand swimmers. And I went to the site of one of them in Montgomery, Alabama, where in Oak Park, it was whites only, this pool, and once a court threatened to integrate the pool um, because Black citizens sued saying, you know, our tax dollars fund this pool, we should be able to swim as well. The town of Montgomery, the city of Montgomery, voted to close the public pool, drain it, fill it in with dirt, seed it over with grass, and not only that, but close the entire Parks and Recreation Department of the city. They even sold off the animals in the zoo. And they kept the Parks and Rec Department closed for a decade. You were near high till 1970 before Montgomery had a Parks and Recreation Department because of racism. And that drained pool has created the drained pool politics that we've had. This sharp rightward turn to austerity from the majority of white voters who who left the Democratic Party after Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, moved to the right, went to trust the market, and what do we have left, right? Now we have a society that can't handle a pandemic in a way that, you know, every other advanced country has been able to do better with fewer deaths. A society with no universal health care, with no universal child care, paid family leave, where we can't keep the lights on and the power on in Texas because they wanted to go it alone and, you know, throw their, their thumb up at government. This is where we all are, in the bottom of a drained pool, at a time when the minimum wage has been stagnant for a decade, and at a time when 40% of adult workers are classified as low wage, making $10 an hour. This, this is really the, the formula that racism has brought us. And that's why the book talks about the cost to everyone. Obviously, all of these systemic racist policies, the shift away has meant that Black families never got to swim, right? We, we never got, you know, the, the bargain, the economic bargain that was, was promised to Americans in the middle of the 20th century. And so racism completely hurts Black folks first and worse, other people of color, indigenous people, you can see it across every measure. And yet, this formula has bankrupted our country in so many ways. And so it has a cost for everyone. It does. I mean, it again, the swimming pool thing is, again, shooting yourself in the foot uh, in order to. So the, uh, the left, you know, I don't know what the, uh, I'll think of this later when I redub myself and sound <laughs> smart. I do that all the time, by the way. Cutting off your nose to spite your face is, I think, what you're Thank you. looking for. You're and welcome. And I will put that in and th- as if I had thought of it. No, I won't. Please do. Uh, I mean, there's so many areas in which that happens. For example, environmentally, you, you have a whole thing about North Richmond. Is that where it is? In, yeah, in, uh, yeah the whole city of Richmond, and then there's a part that's Oh, yeah, that's even, right. North even Richmond worse. is, is yes. Yeah. Anyway, so... Because it's all 97% black and a certain part of it, they've just put these Chevron refineries and it's just awful. And But there is a white area that turns out that uh, they think because of the prevailing winds, they're fine, but they ain't, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so this is another thing where it's like, we're not going to have environmental rules just because 
it'll put black people there <laughs> and they'll get the they'll get the pollution and they'll get sick and they'll get higher incidences of cancer we won't that's right that's it's, nice it's, that's a nice way of thinking isn't it yeah it's it's this this environmental racism <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh. That's another thing I do. I laugh at horrible stuff. You, you know, in some ways you have to, right? I mean, it's just so Thank absurd. You. Thank you. You just have to. It's so absurd. It, it is cutting off your nice nose to spite your face. It is this illusion. Let me write that down. Of, cutting off your nose to spite your face. Okay. Writing that down. You know, out for a minute, <laughs> over the last three years, when I was writing this book, the working title was To Spite Your Face, which I think was funny to me. The, another working title was You Played Yourself, which I think would only kind of be funny to black people. So I, uh -huh. I'm i very happy. I'm very happy with where we ended up. Which no, is you're right. More, this is, this, it, it, this is uh, uplifting. Yes. It's more the us. tone of the book. I mean, I think the book, yeah. I wrote it <laughs> to, to go deep into how terrible everything is, but also, you know, you got to so funny. Hope. You're on tour and the tour, despite your face tour, is very different than the Some of Us tour. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. Well, you, you, you picked the right title. <laughs> <laughs> the uplifting title. Okay. Uh, so, uh, where were we? Well, we were at like the environmental degradation that black and poor people live in in this country, all over this damn country. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of this, the theme of this to me is I think of my former colleagues in the Senate and uh, especially some of the Republicans and just think of like, damn, they're clueless. Mm -hmm. Or they're not clueless yeah. and they're evil yeah. or a little bit of both. Just that they don't understand, like I don't think Kennedy does, don't understand reality. They don't understand the reality that the people that aren't their voters live in. Yeah. And also, I think they do, I think they very much do play to what you're talking about, which is the status, the, the feeling that white people get that we're losing our status. Mm -hmm. And please, 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 just, I want to keep my status. That's right. And that's made more, status is more alluring when you don't have material benefits, right? I mean, this is what, what I write about in the Some of Us. I say that, you know, the economic bargain of white supremacy is getting, you know, cheaper and cheaper, right? Mm. You know, if, if you only have status left because your kid, too, is going five figures into debt to go to college when, you know, you were able to go to college on the government's dime. Um, if you only have status because you also are, you know, one paycheck away and one layoff away from bankruptcy because, you know, the unions that the party that you vote for that, you know, made your intergenerational wealth um, are now on the ropes because of the way that your party treats unions and the, the full-scale attack by corporate America against organized labor that has been cheered on by the Republican Party and therefore by the majority of white people who have voted for it the Republican Party. Um, if that is the case, if you are feeling like, you know, the best days for this country's middle class are behind you, then clinging on to the sense that at least you are reflected in the halls of power, at least you are of the class of people who have, you know, assumed worth, and that you can walk through the world with the privilege of whiteness, then, then perhaps that is even more precious to you than it was a generation ago. And that's what Trump and the right wing are really feeding off of and feeding. You know, they, they for them, the anti-government piece is both ideological and it's strategic because the less that government is a force for good in people's lives, right? The more Americans of all races have to go without, then the more that they can say to their white base, you know, government, is not for you. It's too busy helping the brown and black people. And that's why you are struggling economically. That's why you feel like government isn't on your side. You know, don't don't mind me over here breaking government and cutting a government at every possibility. It's really the brown and black folks' fault. That's their constant message. 
It's their constant message. Just this past week, we we you know have been in the debate over the coronavirus pandemic relief bill, which is more popular than anybody in Washington, right? It is obviously what the country needs. And even Republicans and conservative Republican voters say, of course, we have to do something. In fact, you know, the size is not scary to people. Most people who think the size is not the right number think it might be too small, right? Um, Everyone understands that this country is in serious, serious pain. And yet the entirety of the House Republican caucus felt empowered to vote against it. And what was their message? Joe Biden is opening the border instead of opening our schools. How is that taking care of our kids? That's a direct quote from a Republican congresswoman from South Carolina. So, you know, it's it's this sense that they can count on white votes because of white grievance, even as it means that people die, they lose their jobs, they lose their homes. I mean, it really is a tremendous incalculable cost of racism to our society. It just seems to me that this this just goes over all aspects of life. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, if you're talking about education, (laughs) right. And how segregated our schools continue to be after Brown v. Board. And what happened after Brown v. Board was, a lot of school districts formed that were, okay, we're an independent school district because we're a white area. <laughs> we're going to, you know, we'll be integrated, but not really. Or we'll just form Christian academies. Mm-hmm. And so we're about as, uh, we're almost every bit as segregated as we were, right? Yeah. And the, and the fact of the matter is, and you write some examples of this, and I see this happening, which is a very healthy thing, which is families realizing that, you know what, being in just with white affluent kids in a 100% white school or 99% white school, that might not be the best thing for my kids mm-hmm. in terms of their life. And and even for me as a parent, because I, I have to hang out with these you know, helicopter parents <laughs> who are obnoxious. Whereas I get to, I mean, you show a number of examples of this where someone opts out of that and says, you know what, I'm going to go to the school where my kid isn't part of the, you know, majority. And then you, you kind of track that kid to college and the kid says, yeah, oh God, I'm a lot better off, boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's an important story. You know, it's it's an important way that... Um, that everyday parents of all races are experiencing, you know, the lighter stages of the drained pool politics, which is this idea that you have to pay an arm and a leg for a house to get to a white neighborhood to go to a white school, right? Like, just frankly, right? Well, that is, of course, how we pay for K-12 through education, which is through property taxes, which we got to do something about that, because that automatically means people in poor neighborhoods, whether what we're talking about racially and that cor- does correspond to race because the wealth disparities in between black and white are so evident. So that means, <laughs> that means of course, that if you buy an expensive house and the house is more expensive because it's in this school district because you yeah. pay a premium for that. Everybody yeah. knows that. Oh God, I got to be in that. So the, you know, and also your investment. <laughs> so you invest in this house in this school district, your investment will grow because you're in this mm-hmm. great school district. Mm-hmm. So it's probably a smart economic even decision uh, for you because the value of your house uh, increases, but that only happens if you have the money in the first place, That's which, right. which brings me back to uh, real estate and home ownership, which is to me, one of the basic foundations of the tremendous gap in wealth and income. Uh, a couple of years ago, what was the name of the uh, Boston Globe group that did uh, the thing about the priests? Spotlight. Spotlight. Yes. Thank you. The Spotlight people did a thing on on the wealth of white people in the Boston area versus the wealth of, of black people. And the, the average wealth of a white family in Boston was about $240,000. The average wealth of a black family... $18 for blacks. And this is pre-COVID. Well, this is where history shows up in your wallet. You know, if you have the the policies 
that created the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, that created the subsidies to allow people to get into home ownership without a down payment, the GI Bill, the FHA, the VA, all of that was based on explicitly denying Black people the right to own those homes. The federal government And that's redlining. Not, that's redlining. That's redlining. The federal government said, we are not going to uh, subsidize or backstop or ensure the suburban developments, places like Levittown, right? Places like, you know, one in almost every state, these suburban developments that created these single family housing American dreams all over the country. We will not help you developers. And it's not possible to do it without federal help at that time. If you don't include contracts in these homes, not to sell to black people. Which is shocking. But I, I read that in your book. It's amazing. So that's it's the, amazing. That's like the FHA, right? Right. That's the Federal Housing <laughs> Authority. That is that is the federal government saying we, you have to discriminate. Um, people who want to dig deeper into this should. There's a book by Richard Rothstein called "The Color of Law: How Government Segregated America," and it's so important. It's foundational. Don't make knowledge. people. My listeners have to read another book. <laughs> Fine, you can just read my book. I give you all you need to know. It's the cliff notes of the whole history. <laughs> People who listen to podcasts don't read. They listen to podcasts. <laughs> they can read one book maybe a month, and I would have them read The Sum of Us. Now, don't, don't talk about other books. It's <laughs> just my advice, okay? Take it from one bestseller here. Ixnay, right? <laughs> Ixnay, oh, my other books, eh? Okay. Um, but because of that, because you can say of that, he, uh, say somebody smart said this. Just say that. So, <laughs> <laughs> or how about I say I said? <laughs> yes, do that. Do that. I point out in my book. Yes. The sum of us. This <laughs> on page ninety-seven, <laughs> you can read all you need to know about this history. <laughs> what were we talking about? We were talking about uh, home buying and and. You know, like like we were. I'll, I have a thought. Uh, the GI Bill. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, fight World War II, and if you're black, you fight in an all black unit, <laughs> mm -hmm. of course, and mm -hmm. uh, and because it was, took Truman to integrate the military. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, so you, you you fight World War II. You, uh, you go through that. <laughs> you go through the battle. Of the you go through hell. You, know? <laughs> you go through hell. You come back. There's a GI Bill. Okay, a yeah. GI Bill. Except you can't buy anywhere because you're redlined. Yeah. And because of that, all those guys from that generation who were able to buy, get a house right away, were able to have a house. And then that's how you, in America, that's how we build our our net worth, our, our wealth. That's right. That's how the spotlight people, that's why their their figures came back. And mm -hmm. that, that probably you can just point to the GI Bill. And you yeah. can point to that's how Americans accumulated wealth after World War II. And that is explains such a big part of this gap. Yeah. It's a huge part of the gap. It's a huge part of the $23 billion gap between black and brown on one hand and white on the other hand, school districts, because property values are linked to how much education we give our children, which is criminal. And it's another part of the sort of, you know, privatizing the pool, right? Because of course, you know, when the public pool was drained, it wasn't that no white kids got to swim anymore, only the white kids who couldn't afford to have a backyard pool. This is when you started seeing these members only swim clubs, popping up all over town. In Washington, D.C., over 100 were formed in the years after integration, right? If you got to pay, this is really the story. If you got to pay, it was fine. But that means that, you know, everybody was squeezed and some people just went without. I remember also there was the country club. Yes, and there's always the country club. Yes. the um, When in doubt. And uh, in Minneapolis, I remember uh, I caddied at a uh, country club. Mm. And... Um, there were only white people there. Yes. And also only Gentile people there. Yes, 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 yes. Very lovely. <laughs> oh, man. Where were we? A Jewish country club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so much here. Um, 
Oh, oh, I know. Let's go to uh, the Great Recession, which was caused, Mm. of course, by predatory lending. (laughs) That's a fun topic. You have a a chapter about that, basically, right? Yeah, this is important because, you know, this is how we first met Senator Franken. This is how we first met Mm -hmm. in the aftermath of the crash and in the efforts to create the Wall Street Reform Bill, which you were a real leader on. And I really will always have so much respect for you because of your, you were part of a group of, you know, maybe half a dozen senators who were never going to back down and had the backbone to keep making the bill stronger and adding provisions even after, you know, the banks had combed all the way through it and gotten what they wanted. And it was really remarkable. Well, thank you. Uh, You know, a big part of the problem was that uh, Wall Street started securitizing these subprime mortgages into financial packages, and the credit rating agencies gave AAA ratings to these uh, financial packages that ended up being junk. But the uh, credit rating agencies, like Standards and Poor's and Moody's and Fitch, uh, kept giving these packages, uh, these packages of mortgages, AAAs, uh, because if they give a package a AAA, then they get the next job to rate the next package, right? Mm-hmm. You're paying your teachers for your grades. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and then they uh, keep chopping up these subprime mortgages and securitizing them. And the credit rating agencies kept giving these packages triple A's, which were later downgraded to junk. And the losses came to half a trillion dollars, which led to the collapse that caused the Great Recession. So I wrote a provision in the Senate bill that said that the banks can't pay for a AAA, that formed a board within the SEC that would assign a credit rating agency to a package each time based on the credit rating agency's uh, capacity uh, to uh, rate these packages and uh, and their track record over over time. So that you can't basically shop for your... That's right, yeah. Shop for your grade. Yeah, so... the credit rating agencies would get more business based on, on their track record. So if a, a credit rating agency gave triple A's to things that, that went under, that hurts their track record, and they don't get future assignments. So my amendment got 64 votes in the Senate, but it got weakened in conference committee. This is when the House and Senate had conference committees, and I blame uh, Barney Frank and Chris Dodd and... Uh, and Chuck Schumer for for not fighting for that in conference. And anyway, no bitterness here. <laughs> the Senate is a great place. It usually functions in, uh, to make good economic policy decisions. Um, but yes, we were talking about the financial crisis. This this is the chapter in my book. It's called "Ignoring the Canary," that I feel the most uh, sort of passion about. I cut my teeth as an economic policy wonk on the issue of financial regulation and consumer protection back in the early 2000s when we were starting to see signs of these new kinds of mortgages, not your 30-year fixed rate mortgages, but rather these mortgages that had all these new terms that were far more expensive in terms of the rate that had all these hidden fees and that were just bad policy. And yet they were being justified by regulators who said, sure, it's fine to flood the market with these because they had been tested out first in black and brown neighborhoods. And the logic was, well, remember that that, you know, black people equals risk, which was the federal government's policy from 1932 to 1977, basically. Then 20 years later, it flips and, you know, actually these neighborhoods where black people are are probably still quite risky. And so the banks and the lenders should price for the risk, meaning you should charge someone 9% interest on a refinance of the home they already owned. This is another piece of the story that is so often skipped over is that the majority of subprime loans were not helping people get into home ownership that they couldn't afford. It was taking the wealth out of existing homes. And these are people like refinancing in order to send somebody to college or something, exactly. right? Yeah, okay. Refinancing in order to pay off other debt, to send someone to college, to fix the patch in the roof, whatever it is. Refinancing, frankly, Al, because somebody knocked on their door and called their phone over and over and over again until they finally said yes. This was aggressive marketing 
targeted at black and brown neighborhoods, and the majority of subprime loans went to people who had good credit that could have qualified for cheaper loans because right. there was no limit. There's no law that says that you have to offer someone the loan that they qualify for. The limit is what you can get away with. And who could they get away with cheating? Black and brown people. And I was in those regulator conversations where folks just said, you know, it, these people, we put them into homes they couldn't afford. And that's why you're seeing this rash of foreclosures in the early 2000s. And of course, what we know, what we knew then, and we know even clearer now, is that Black borrowers with the exact same credit histories and scores and loan to values and all of that as white borrowers were three times as likely to be sold these toxic loans. And so that's why this chapter in The Sum of Us talks about the financial crisis as a multi-trillion dollar cost of racism to everyone. Because if, if there had not been the racist discriminatory targeting and lending, if regulators and the people in power to stop it had held black borrowers and homeowners in more esteem and said, wait, actually, it's not their fault. It's the lender's fault and something's wrong here and we should do something about it. Then it wouldn't have spiraled out of control and ended up taking down, nearly taking down the entire global economy. And, and that's what happened. It starts with the predatory lending and people not being able to carry that. And then suddenly those houses go up on the market and, and then it starts to unravel. And that's what happened. Yeah, because it was making money hand over fist. I mean, then you get to the Wall Street side of it. There's the household side of it, which is, you know, what are the loans? What are the terms? But then the reason it got super powered was because Wall Street greed said, wow, we can make twice our money here. Um, you know, we can have these prepayment penalties and balloon payments, and we can have 9, 10, 12, 13, 15% interest rates on six-figure loans. And then there was just a flood of money, and, and, and lenders couldn't issue these loans fast enough to deal with the demand from Wall Street to securitize them. And the securitization is what cut the tie of mutual interest between the lender and the borrower, because the bank could say, I'll issue this loan I'll be gone tomorrow. I will have sold it on to Wall Street. I don't care if this homeowner ends up in foreclosure. And then, of course, you have the credit ratings agency saying, as long as you slice and dice these loans and give us the money to rate them, we'll say they're all A+, plus, even though you know the underlying mortgage is one that has a, is a ticking time bomb for the homeowner. And so you just had this sort of passing the buck and passing the buck, and the people that were hurt first and worst were Black families who still have not recovered home ownership rates and wealth rates, and we're back to what we were before the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, thank you, Senator Kennedy. No, there's no systemic racism. Um, you know, it, it's really a tragedy. It's a tragedy that, like all of racism, impacts Black families the most. But, you know, my that chapter is full of stories of white people whose lives are never going to be the same from the cascading losses from the financial crisis. And of course, uh, Wall Street then started making different financial packages from those things, which were completely out of, you know, multipliers of the problem. That's right. Yeah. Um, so Lewiston, Maine. Hmm. The good news story. The good news story. Let's sort of go to some good news. Uh, Lewiston, Maine remind me a little bit of Wilmer, Minnesota, but I'll go to Lewiston first and then I'll tell you a little bit about Wilmer. Uh, Lewiston, Maine is, uh, they had mills there, is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the mills went away. And how, how, where is Lewiston in relation, say, to Portland, Maine? It's about an hour from Portland. Is it north? Is it north of Portland? It's north, yeah. So yeah. it's sort of the central, central Maine. Okay. So their mills are closing and they start to get, uh, Somali Folks that are coming in, uh, there's a civil war in Somalia, uh, and we have a big influx of Somalis in Minnesota. I think we have the probably number one Somali population, but uh, 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 quite a few go to Lewiston, Maine. Yep. And tell us about that. So Lewiston, as a place where the jobs have gone, you know, the young people have left, it's Maine is the oldest state in the nation, the whitest state in the nation. 
is sort of a poster child for the kind of, you know, Rust Belt nostalgia that appeal that Trump, you know, preyed upon. This idea that our best days are behind us and that in fact, you know, the right wing story would go, everything was going great until the brownies and the blackies came, right? Everything was going great until civil rights, until black people started getting ahead, until the immigration laws changed in 1965 to allow people from not just Europe to come into the country legally. Uh, and become From shithole countries. From shithole countries, exactly. Mm-hmm. Oh, Donald Trump. Um <laughs> Uh, so, right, so yeah. the, it's sort of ground zero for the zero-sum story. Um, and yet, the Main Street, which, you know, held a lot of vacant properties and boarded up storefronts, has really come alive in recent years. Um, most small towns like Lewiston are, you know, closing schools and, you know, putting libraries on every other day because there just isn't the revenue. And yet Lewiston is building a brand new schoolhouse. And it's because of the influx of new Mainers from, um, you know, if you if you live in Maine and someone's from not Maine, they just call you from away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and these are people from really away. These are people, <laughs> they're African Muslim refugees. And I visit Lewiston in the book and I talk to the city, admin, the town administrator, this guy named Phil, who just can't say enough good things about what the new Mainers have done for the economy of Lewiston. And I go down the main street and I talk to um, Somali shopkeepers and I talk to white Lewiston folks who have really turned their own lives around by getting involved in the community. One of the people I talked to is a woman named Cecile, who is a Franco-Canadian, which was sort of the last wave of, of people from away in Maine at the turn of the century. And she had lost her French, you know, a good portion of of the Maine population that sort of did that kind of immigrant assimilation thing where they, you know, were used to be derided as Francos and they were, you know, there's a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment and then they sort of assimilated into whiteness. And she's getting on in years and she decides that she wants to recall the language of her youth. She's feeling very isolated. She has no family in the city. And so she, ends up leaning on the Francophone African refugee and immigrant population for these language exchanges. And they become the center of her life. And she ends up integrating the immigrant Francophone folks with the old white Mainers at the Franco Center downtown. And you've got this incredible cultural exchange. And it's just a story that is one place. And yet, you know, if you look across the country, where rural towns have stopped bleeding population, where they're growing, where they're getting back on their feet, it's because of immigrants from Latin America and Asia and Africa. And this is a possibility, right, of people putting aside the zero-sum story, linking arms across race, and unlocking what I began to call in my journey to write the book, these solidarity dividends, these ideas of these gains that can only come through working together across lines of race to create a majoritarian push for the kinds of solutions that we all need, whether it's cleaner air, better funded schools, more jobs, higher wages. There's a good news story in each of the chapters about basically people who are figuring out a better way to do it, to refill the pool of public goods for everyone, to you know amass enough bargaining power to take on the polluters, to take on the boss, and to restore a sense of dignity to our people. Even, yes, people who are not only white. There's a town in Minnesota, Wilmer, Minnesota, which is the county seat of Candy Yohai County. And Candy Yohai County is the largest turkey producing county in Minnesota. Minnesota's the largest turkey producing state. And they have a Jenny O meatpacking or turkey packing plant there. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Wilmer has uh, decades ago started uh, getting an influx of Latinx folks, right? to work in, in the Genio factory. And then, um, maybe starting about 15 years ago or so, uh, Somalis. And mm-hmm. so uh, one day I'm in my office uh, at the Senate and I get told that we have a new page. Uh, you don't always have a new page. Each page class is about 30, so not every state gets a new page. We have a new page. Her name is Muna Abdullahi and she's from Wilmer and she's a Somali Minnesotan. So I go down to the flesh and let's meet her and the whole new 
Paige Glass is there in their uniforms, and she has a hijab, mm -hmm. and she's Somali. So I go up to her, and I go, you look like a Minnesotan. <laughs> and Muna laughs, and she's an unbelievable young lady. And they're like juniors in, in high school. So when she uh, she goes back after her time as a page, and then I learn she's graduating uh, from high school. So I, I invite myself <laughs> to introduce her at the commencement. Mm. So I go there, and I look at the program. There's about 240 kids graduating. About half of them are named things like Nelson and Hovland and Carlson. Uh, and they're your Norwegian, Swedish, Minnesotan types, you know. Mm -hmm. And then about, I don't know, I'd say about 30% or so are Latino. Mm -hmm. And then about 15% are uh, Somali. Mm -hmm. And uh, Emuna is one of the class speakers. So the class speakers are the uh, valedictorian, a, a girl who was born in Peru, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tate Hovland, the class mm -hmm. president, who's half Norwegian, half German, and uh, in, in stock, and then Muna. And they loved each other. Mm -hmm. They loved each other, these kids. And um, it was it was one, the best thing I'd been to ever. <laughs> yeah. No, it's the most beautiful thing, isn't it? I mean, when you see this country's promise play out, right, it's such an old, fallacious idea, the idea of the zero sum, the idea that we should, you know, keep our players apart, right? We are on the same team in this society. We need each other. We have got to recognize that. And if we do, the sky is the limit for what this country can do. The, the optimism that I have is from seeing signs like that, seeing places like that, seeing people, whether it's a factory worker in Mississippi, a fast food worker in Kansas City, you know, a retiree in Maine, you know, an immigrant in uh, Richmond, California, who had seen the power that comes from letting go of the divides, letting go of the degrading stereotypes and linking arms and rolling up their sleeves to, to fight alongside each other. I mean, that's solidarity, right? It's, it's not saying unity. It's saying, in fact, your fight may be slightly different than mine. But I know that if I fight for you and you fight for me, we're all going to do better. And, you know, back to Paul Wellstone. We do all do better when we all do better. Heather, thank you so much. Gee, the book is great. And uh, thank you for all the work you've done with Demos all along. You're a real treasure. Thank you so much, Senator. Really appreciate you. Appreciate your voice. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.